Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, licensed professional counselor. In today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Deidre Fagan. If you are someone who is facing grief, dealing with existential issues such as how to live more deeply, how to help someone who is dying, or maybe you are dying yourself, I believe that you are going to appreciate this episode. We really get into her new book, Find a Place for Me, Embracing Love and Life in the Face of Death. And we will get into all of the raw material that she discussed and so much more. And we will talk about grief and life and therapy and caregiving and love and all of that. And I think that this is a special episode for many people who want to open up a conversation to something deeper. A little bit about Dr. Fagan. She is a widow, a wife, a mother of two, and an associate professor and coordinator of creative writing at Ferris State University. Dr. Fagan also is a divorcee and the sole survivor of her birth family. She is the author of a memoir, Find a Place for Me, which was just published in 2022, a collection of short stories, The Grief Eater, a poetry chapbook, Have Love, and a reference book, The Critical Companion to Robert Frost. Her work has been recently published in Newsweek, The Daily Mail, The Coil, Emerge, Literary Journal, Yonia Review, Rat's Ass Review, Red F Review, and The Truval Review. Fagan is also the poetry editor at Orange Blossom Review. Fagan holds a Doctorate of Arts in Humanistic Studies, English and Philosophy, and a Master of Arts in English from the University at Albany, SUNY, and a Bachelor of Arts in English from the University of Buffalo. Also a literary scholar, her essay on Emily Dickinson was collected in Harold Bloom's Modern Critical Views. Dr. Fagan has been teaching college literature and writing courses for more than two decades, and you're about to meet her. Let's get to the interview. Dr. Deirdre Fagan, welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm so glad that today you're going to speak to us about your book, Find a Place for Me, Embracing Love and Life in the Face of Death. And... For people that are just tuning in, you probably have heard the introduction, but it is a memoir and it involves a very catastrophic and usually private event of your husband, Bob, being diagnosed with ALS, also known as Luke Gehrig's disease, and going through the last time of his life with you and until he passed away. Um, and so I think this is very raw and authentic material and well needed uh, as our culture is very death, death denying and uh, a death denying culture and in America. And so I think that this is important for people to read and people that are into psychology and philosophy will can, can really find something from this book because it deals with a lot of existential issues and, um, you and Bob just knowing that he had a terminal illness and going through all of that. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about why um, you decided to write this book? Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Paul. I'm happy to be here. Oh, sure. Um, so I had some public and private reasons for writing the book. Um, private reasons are, uh, you know, to get down these memories that um, I started writing about five years six years after Bob. Well, I decided I would start writing about five years after and started really digging into it. Actually, the first, I should I should back up. The prologue was written while he was alive. So I'd already had in mind I was going to write about this someday. But um, it was many years after he died before I could actually really not only dedicate the time, but be emotionally ready to write the book. And so the personal reasons were to, you know, actually transcribe some of those memories, have them for myself and have them for my children. But obviously writing a book for the public like there's many, many public reasons that go well beyond the, you know, I could keep a diary for, for my personal reasons or write it and stick it in a shoebox. But I wrote it for the public because um, we had many people approach us not only while Bob was sick, but after he died, approaching me about how we had handled his death, the choices that we had made. And um, many commented, especially about Bob, that he had always taught them how to embrace life, but they had also that he had also taught them how to die well um, by how the decisions he made and how he chose to handle it. 
and that they thought I should write about that. I was a you know, writer already. They knew me as a writer and they thought that I should share that. Um, I completely agree. Bob was a philosopher. He taught philosophy. Uh, he studied philosophy for, you know, more than a decade. He had his PhD in philosophy. And so he always said, I, I came to terms with my own death in my twenties. And, um, so he had already processed a lot of his own emotions about death before he was ever facing this particular situation. And I agree, you know, our culture is a death denying culture. In my opinion, many people avoid it. Don't talk about it. We had talked about it. We'd been through loss together. And so we weren't going to approach his death any differently. Um, I wanted to write about, you know, obviously that's the subtitle embracing, um, life. Uh, and, you know, but I, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, but I also wanted to talk about, um, caregiving, the difficulties of caregiving, self-care while caregiving. Many, many people are caregiving at this point in time because so many people are living so much longer. I wanted to talk about love after loss, um, whether that loss is the end of a relationship, uh, the end of a marriage, um, losing somebody, and I wanted to talk about love. There's, as you said um, earlier, there's a, a a lot of honesty in this book, a lot of raw material, and our our relationship was incredibly open and honest. And in talking to many others, I didn't get the impression that that's always the case with people. And sometimes definitions of love are not always the healthiest one. I feel like there's still kind of a per pervasive notion that love is possession. An ownership of some kind. Bob and I used to have those conversations um, also as they relate to our children and how sometimes parents will see their children as something that they sort of own and can dictate how, how they will be and what choices they will make and recognizing people as separate individuals. Um, so yeah, that's sort of a rundown. We'd both been married before and divorced. So uh we also, you know, had very open conversations about that and the shaming that still can go on in society and that can cause people to feel shame about divorce. And I wanted to open up those conversations as well, because I, I disagree with, with that too. <laughs> so with the idea of shame, I want to, I think we have a shaming culture about lots of things. Um, and I, I wanted to open up those conversations. Yes, I do think, um, there are lots of books you know, have been coming out about shame and dealing with shame, especially Brene Brown, of course, has been writing a lot about shame. And I do think there's a lot of cultural things that have been passed on, even just recently, even though we're quite a melting pot here, um, depending on your region uh, of judgment and shame and possession. Uh, and so I think that, you know, writing a book that is this detailed about the conversations you were having and um and going into such you know openness and writing so openly about all these different aspects so i mean just for the listeners out there i mean this book doesn't like make anything sound fluffy and nice um it's the actual like your panic attacks drinking um making love when you're disabled um bob wanting you to get remarried and find love after he passed away him telling you this to your face like early on which was making me think wow he really thought about you and the kids like he really wanted you to be happy and not just like like that possession like you have to honor like you are honoring his memory but there's some people that are like you know it's it seems like they they can't handle that because of jealousy right or something um, yeah, they only have one idea of honoring, right? Is mm -hmm. what it seems like. And honoring means, you know, never loving again <laughs> or never right. loving before. I'm always surprised by the couples I meet who say, we just don't talk about that. We, we, we don't, we've never talked about past relationships. Like we just don't go there. Um, we talked about it all past relationships. And then when the time came future. Yes. And so I think that um, we are going through a bit of a cultural change especially with the younger people because uh, i don't know where it all started i'm not an expert on that but it does seem like people started writing anonymously in internet forums about very personal things like on reddit and other chat boards about 10 20 years ago 30 years ago and uh, it seems uh, because 
there are now places to converse that are other than the newspaper and a, a local place where you'd have coffee, you could you could anonymously spill your guts. And I feel like that's actually drifted into mainstream conversations um, and, you know, meetup groups and, um, you know, different places, especially college campuses, talking about authenticity and being honest about how you're feeling. And I just in my lifetime, I've seen um, with males and females and well, males and males, but my experience is uh, with males and females, mostly being heterosexual, that the conversations about relationships and feelings and sex and money and um, time spent and power sharing has really changed a lot. And I think this book is also spearheading that with people that have been married and lost somebody or been divorced and have kids. I mean, I think it's just it's important that we talk about real things. And I think, I don't know why, maybe the Puritan past of America and this sort of um, different cultures have this way of wanting to have a narrative that sounds really good for keeping up appearances, so to speak. I mean, it could be tied to religion. It could be tied to propriety um, that we just don't talk about those things. And um, in this book, you talk about everything. I was just slammed with, you know, you, you pick up a book and you know, someone's going to die at the end. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, I don't know how, how this is going to go, but I was just, <laughs> I was enthralled and just kept reading and faster and faster. Cause I was like, what I, I just want it. It's brings you into it so that you can almost visualize your life. Um, so yeah, I guess we're talking about in general right now, kind of the public. So maybe we'll talk about the public a little bit before going into the personal, but you you because you write so personally about your relationship with bob and and his and his death and everything that happened i feel like that leads to a public um i don't know response of wow thank you for writing this right and and also hopefully this will inspire other people to actually have honest conversations in their relationships and not just hide in a sort of defensive shell so those are some thoughts i had off the top of my head we can go anywhere you want I hope so too. Um, you said so many things that, you know, resonated with me. I hope that I have more opportunities to meet with groups of people who need to have these conversations and want, you know, some way to frame them. You know, you can start with a book and then see where it goes kind of thing. Um, but yes, a lot of the responses that I've had from readers has been, you know, wow, it's so raw. It's so honest. I feel like I'm in the room with both of you. Sometimes I feel a little voyeuristic <laughs> because it's so intimately written that I feel present with, you know, in these conversations, these very intimate conversations that you and Bob are having. Um, and that was my intention I would go, you know, you were talking about the last 20 years and those conversations opening up. Um, for me, my perspective is I think even the, the crazy talk shows of the 80s started some of that, but it was, you know, more sensationalistic, you know, than maybe where we are now. But I think it sort of started that. And then for me in the 90s, um, which is when, you know, the whole period I was in college and graduate school was the 90s. That's when I my love for memoir was born. And that's when so many were being published. And that's when the genre really was just booming. And I think that that also that writing those books started the, some of those conversations. And then it took longer to get to the place that, that you're talking about where it's, you know, it's not just on, you know, talk TV and it's not in books, but it's, you know, people are are having more open conversations, but I still agree that there's, there's farther to go, right. There's more, there's more that we need to discuss. And so, you know, those, those are the goals here, but I do think, um, you know, people said to me how, well, actually, when I first had readers before it was published and I was getting some responses, I, I said, I'm just, I wonder if people can handle this book. You know, are they ready for this book? And I had a number of people say, you you go, you know, really raw with some things, but I think the public's ready, ready to have those conversations. So that was really encouraging for me that, that maybe there would be an audience that wanted that wanted to hear these things so that it would free them. And so far, the people who have, you know, directly communicated with me after reading, that's been largely the response. Like I have lost people, whether it's siblings or parents or whatever. And just the way I handle those emotions was very realistic for them. They could connect. It was cathartic. It um 
validated their own experience, made them feel like they wanted to talk to me more about their own experience. Um, so, so far it's doing the kind of work I hoped it would do. You know, I'll never have a full understanding of, you know, because many people don't tell you, it's like you can teach for 25 years and the number of students who actually tell you what they feel about your class beyond a course evaluation is pretty small. So, you know, I won't always have a full response from readers. They'll keep it to themselves, but I'm, you know, it gives me hope that, that it's reaching its audience and that it's needed for that audience. Yeah, I definitely think that it is needed. And yeah, I, I like that you trace the histories back to the talk shows. And then I was actually, my brain rattled even back to the 70s of telling when I wasn't alive, but telling people about those encounter groups that the therapists started because they were trying to get what was the real reaction to therapy instead of this like therapeutic, like you're the doctor reaction. So they had these groups where people would just say, this, this is what I think about life. This is what I think about you. And it was like raw and people were crying. So I feel like our culture needs that. It started very niche. Now it's getting more broad. And because what what do you do if somebody dies and everyone around you is just giving you platitudes and little, you know, it happened, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, this is they're in heaven yeah. with angels and flying around and and all of these sort of like nice little little story, myth, mythological stories that we can't really prove that I don't I don't think that really helps people feel better versus like, let's talk about what they meant to you. Let's let's talk about how it was for you. Um, how do you, what are your, what are the things you miss about them? What are the things um, that they annoyed? They were, were, you know, everybody has a complex relationship with each other. So, you know, sometimes I hear people die and it's everyone's like, oh, they were so wonderful. And and it's like, yeah, yeah they were, but they were also an asshole. Like, what about that? Right. It's what about the honesty? And so in your <laughs> book, you kind of, you, you, you and Bob are just joking a lot. Actually, you're using a lot of humor to cope with what he's going through and he's making jokes about losing muscle function um and you know and how you're gonna have to change his diapers and how you should go get cigarettes and 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 have a glass of wine and and you know relax because your life sucks right now and we know it sucks right now and that's honesty right and that, that i don't know it sucks but it's also like freeing versus like being in denial of these feelings um and so what yeah. i, I I guess I'm still on the authenticity kick right now, but yeah. Yeah. And um, I like that you use the term diapers because that's what Bob wanted me to use, right? We were, as a couple from the time we met, we both had the attitude of the only way you're going to deal with your life is by looking at it head on, you know? And so we always said, and I mentioned this in the book, get that stuff out of your back pocket and put mm -hmm. it in front of you and deal with it. Um, if you're always dragging your baggage, your luggage, you know, on a wheelie cart behind you, it's going to be hitting your heels and you're just pulling it around. It's a weight on you. Um, if you get it around in front of you and unzip that sucker, <laughs> you, know, you might start pulling some stuff out and then, you know, find you don't need half of it anymore or whatever, or, you know, find a way to manage it differently or you give it a different shape, you know, put it in one of those, uh, one of those bags that you suck all the air out of, compress it, whatever. Um, but we, we always said, you know, poke holes at those things. And, um, Bob would, you know, he had this way, anybody who knew him, where he would call people out on their, well, I'll, I'll you know, use a euphemism, their, their garbage or whatever. Um, he would call them out on that. And so there's a, he, he would look at them, pause and say, yeah, but, you know, you got to kind of look at that, right? He'd say something like that, or he'd look at them, you know, and pause and say, yeah, but, uh, does that really make any sense to you? You know, he would just push them to think about something that they said, but he would do it in this non-threatening way. And so he, you know, people often credited Bob for causing him to think, causing them to think more about a lot of topics in their life when we were just in casual conversation. So when it came time for us to face things, you know, Bob, one of the things I loved about him throughout our marriage is if he saw me having some sort of, you know, emotional reaction to something and he thought it was BS, he would just call me out on it. And I loved that. I mean, because it would make me look at myself, you know, and say, yeah, why am I doing that? That doesn't make any sense. And after he was sick, he said, you know, we're, we're still us, like, we're still going to do this. And he, he said, you're going to have to tell me 
sometimes you're going to have to be my mind and you're going to have to tell me things that maybe I don't want to hear or am not realizing. And I'm, I'm counting on you for that. Um, and that, and I said the same thing. I was like, I need you to also be that person. We've always been that we're not going to, you know, we're going to treat this the same way. And so one of the hard things that I had to do, for example, is point out to him when it was time for him to not do something, which is a very hard thing to tell somebody. So for example, when I realized that climbing the stairs was becoming incredibly dangerous, I was the one who said, you know, I think this is like the last time I, I, I don't think you should be doing this anymore. And, um, you know, delivering that kind of news to anybody is difficult, but it was healthy and it was necessary. And sometimes we just avoid healthy because it's hard. And, you know, but the truth is that the heart, you know, everything that's really valuable, truthfully, is a little hard. I mean, easy is usually not super valuable. Yes, it's true. I mean, we grow through making mistakes and uh, you know we learn to not do things usually through pain or uh, a problem you know we learn how to you know when we're trying something as a child you know we burn our hand we learn not to touch the stovetop after somebody's done cooking or whatever so i do think that you know we learn through pain and suffering we grow through it nobody likes it and so we do try to avoid it. And I think then, unfortunately, that same thing we do physically moves into relationships. And so we have a lot of people that are in relationships that were once alive and vibrant, and then they become kind of dead, and they're not growing, and they're just kind of like going through these motions, and they have all this stuff inside of them they want to say. And with some people, when they go through um, a tragic situation like you and Bob went through, that can bring out that aliveness. But some people, oftentimes, it becomes more dead, even more dead. Um, and I mean dead in the metaphorical sense where the relationship doesn't feel alive and people don't feel like they can say certain things to each other without fear of punishment or something going on. So I really think that the example you and Bob set in the in the book and in your life, but in the book because we read it, um, was is just wonderful, you know, to to be so honest and so, I mean, talking about the depression and the shock and the horror of finding out the diagnosis in the beginning to all these things he had to go through, which is just sounds horrifying, you know, of losing all his functioning and muscles and you having, you're taking care of the kids and trying to figure out work things and all of that. You know, the example is that you went through the highs and the lows, but you didn't turn off. You know, and I think there's a lot of people that just like turn off and numb out and are, you know, obviously, you know, with hospice, they'll numb you out because it hurts so much. But but you didn't numb out your relationship. And I think that is a very good example of how to live. Yeah, I think with many things, you know, many, many people close down and um, I, I've observed that a lot throughout my life, that the primary response for people um, in you know, in relation to loss, in relation to difficulty, um, disappointment, rejection, whatever is to completely shut down. And I, I have this phrase that I've adopted that is love your way forward. Um, and I, I don't, I'm, what I mean by that is also metaphorical, like open your heart and your mind to what's around you, to the people around you. And it doesn't have to mean, again, romantic love. It could be your friendships. It could be, you know, your family. But if you if you can keep yourself open in the face of difficulty, there is so much opportunity. But when you close down, you, you completely shut it down. And your metaphor of being dead, you know, I mentioned um, Bob and I were both married before. And when I first got with him, I had gone through a lot of my process about, you know, why I'd left the marriage and all of that. He had not, and he felt a lot of shame. He felt like he had been a failed spouse and he didn't, you know, he, he hadn't really processed his emotions or why that relationship actually should have ended and that it's okay for some relationships to end. It's actually better for both people if they end <laughs> and that, you know, you don't have to carry shame about that. In fact, you can celebrate it. And so eventually through our early conversations and, and talking about both of our marriages that had occurred just before we got together, you know, he, he used to say later of me, he said, you were 
you were dead in that relationship. And I said, I was like at the end, you know, I really tried, but I felt like I was dying. I felt like parts of me were dying because I was unable to express them in that relationship. And so I was losing parts of myself. And the only way really, you know, I tried within the relationship to maintain those aspects of myself, but it wasn't possible. So the only way to get that back was to leave. And we were much more alive and thriving together um, with the way that we handled our relationship and the openness. Um, I, The only reason I think I'm still alive and on the planet, I went through a lot of loss in my life and a lot of struggles and difficulties, is because I, stay, I remained open to trying again. So I always tell people, um, you know, if a, if a, if you date somebody for five years and you break up, people say, oh, that was sad. But if in year four, you marry somebody and then you get divorced in, in year five, you know, that's when the shaming comes in. And I always say, well, wait, you took it another step, which means you were still trying and believing in love. And how awesome is that, that you believed enough to give it a go, you know? And if you get married again after that, how great is that, that you're trying again? Again, you're believing again. It means that you have hope and you're you're giving it a go. But if you shut down after that, not you're not only like shaming further shaming yourself, you know, going along with the cultural idea, like, oh, I'm ashamed, I should shut down, I shouldn't try again, I was a failure. Um, but you're you're taking away any possibility you have for that connection that you once really wanted. You know, I mean, if you never wanted to be in a relationship, then you probably wouldn't have been. But if you've been in one and it has failed, you probably wanted one. And getting back to that idea that I really want this in my life. And that just didn't work with that person. Look at all the people in the world. There's so much possibility. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, we have our personal wounds. And a lot of these go back to childhood with how we attach to people. And then when something doesn't go right in a relationship, uh, there is a propensity to find a reason or to move the emotions onto something. So a lot of people just blame themselves. They just say, well, I'm defective and uh, no one would love me and whatever garbage they come up with. Um, and then also there's other people that will just go, well, that person sucks. And they're terrible, they're demons, they're, I mean, some, sometimes they are, but, you know, but I hear this also often, either I'm terrible or they're demon spawn. I mean, it, every time a guy comes to me and says, my ex-wife was the devil, I'm like, oh, that's a lot of devils in the world. I really, I really <laughs> doubt it. I mean, with severe mental illness, it's like 4% of the population. So unless your wife was one of these 4% of population. I, I just don't believe you. I think that you decided she was the devil and that's how you justified breaking up. Um, and so, it's so I, funny. You should <laughs> say that. I have a great story about that. Oh, so okay. it, it relates to memoir. So I, at my former institution, I had a class completely devoted to memoir writing. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite classes to teach, one of the most rewarding throughout my entire career of teaching because of the community that's formed in that class and the work that people actually put in on their writing because of the nature of the class, like, because they're so invested in their own personal stories, right? But I had a student who was um, recently divorced. She was around 25. Everybody in her family had married their high school sweetheart and was still married, like aunts, uncles, grandparents, her parents, right? So when she divorced at 25, she just felt awful. Like she was the failure. She didn't succeed as a member of this family and staying with her high school sweetheart. So that's what she wanted to write about. So the first draft she brought into class and we were workshopping was all about how I will use your word. This person she'd married was the devil. You know, it was like 10 pages of how awful he was. And, you know, I let the students make all their comments and I'm the whole time they're commenting on the writing and whatever. I'm thinking there's an elephant in this room that, you know, now it's my job as teacher to kind of jump in and say. And I said, the thing is, if I'm reading a memoir and the narrator is telling me the entire time how bad this other person was, I am not looking at that person. I'm looking at the narrator saying, why would you marry somebody who's so awful? 
what is with you that you married this person in the first place? He sounds like a horrible person, right? So I said, I know this is going to be really, really hard, but the only way for this to be a really good piece of writing is if we experience all of it with you. We are not at all, you know, disappointed or devastated by the end of this relationship or the disappointments that he caused you that caused it to end unless we fall in love with him first. We need to fall in love because you did. That's what caused you to marry him. And then when the things start to happen that are so disappointing and crushing, we will feel them. We will be disappointed and we will connect with you. And that's, you know, you're the one writing this piece. This is your perspective. And she said, oh, you're going to make me go there. <laughs> I have to go. I, you know, I don't, I hate this guy now, you know? And I said, if you want to write, I mean, you don't have to write about this. You pick the topic, but if you're going to write about it and you're going to do it well, we have to fall in love. We have to be disappointed. We have to be where you are. And, you know, she pushed herself and she did it. And it was one of the greatest pieces out of, you know, all the ones that I've read because she took us on that whole journey. Um, so yeah, when somebody tells me like, they're horrible, I say, well, <laughs> you know, if you don't tell us the full story, then, you know, what, what's the part you're leaving out? They're not, they can't be all horrible. You wouldn't have been with them, I assume. Yes, exactly. Not every, you know, and so, and, and this is tough and I'm glad you talk about the full story. And I think that's the hard part about our culture is people are taught not to tell the whole story, um, in childhood for whatever reason. We don't talk about that in our family. We don't do that in our family. We don't talk about that in this religion. So mm -hmm. I think exactly. there, and, and coming into the therapy world, and we'll get back to your story, but in the therapy world, a lot of people get wounded from a love relationship and then they're afraid to take risks. So it becomes internalized that either they're, not only are they terrible, but all people that look like them or sound like them are terrible, or I'm just terrible and I'm defective and I might as well just date people that are awful on purpose. So I'm not disappointed mm -hmm. or I just won't date again and I will just hide away in my room and say it's woe is me, you know, and and that's depression and that's trauma and that's real stuff. But I think I wanted to say that you and Bob, I don't you were in therapy for part of this and you'd been in therapy. Um, so I, you did talk about that, um, but it's really therapy, writing whatever you can do, I think I want to say to the listeners, like there is a way through anything. Um, and, and I don't really want to be tested by the gods on that, but, um, you were, uh, you went through, uh, the loss of your father and your brother uh, within a month or something. It was in a month. Within or... two weeks. So two when weeks? I was, um, yeah. When I was 18, my eldest brother died by suicide. Mm -hmm. And when I was 23, my mom um, died of cancer. I got the news and she died two months later. Um, and then, you know, then I had kind of a period of stability when it comes to loss um, between, let's see, 93 and 2006. I, was, I had my dad and my brother. And um, Bob and I had gotten together in 2000. So actually, part, I think part of why we handled his illness the way we did is also that in 2006, we had lost my father to a heart attack and then my brother two weeks later um, to liver failure. And I was the last person standing. My parents had also split up when I was seven years old. So, you know, there was a lot of healing that my brother and dad and I did together um, from 93 to 2006 after my mother had had died because I had been with her and my brother had been with my father and we saw each other very little as we continued to grow up. Um, so we had sort of this complicated background, but then we had this fabulous relationship. And so by the time I got with Bob, he also had a fabulous relationship with my father and brother. And so he mourned them just as deeply, I would say, as I did. I mean, we were both you know, absolutely devastated. Losing my father was one thing, having lost my mother so early. I was always bracing for impact, knowing you know, I'm going to lose my dad. That's the likelihood. He's, you know, obviously as the parent, more likely to die before me. So I'd, you know, I'd always been processing, like it's going to happen someday. But um, losing my brother really is, you know, I lost my father and it was awful. But then I only had two weeks to even begin to, to process that. And I was the one managing everything. 
um, you know, all the plans and obituaries and all of that. And then I, you know, my father, my brother was clear on the other side of the country. And then uh, I got the news that he had died. And then I was just absolutely leveled. And so was Bob. And we had a three-year-old at the time, you know, and we were just trying to manage our grief and our jobs and nurture our son. And then five years later, this happened, you know, Bob was diagnosed and basically everybody who knew us was like, of all the families in all the world, like, well, seriously, this is going to happen to yours. You've all, you've been through enough. Like you've, and I said, yeah, I know I've paid my dues in the loss department. I feel like, you know, if everybody get, has to deal with this, I've, I've paid my dues. Like, I don't want this to happen to anybody's husband, but why did it have to happen to mine? You know, and that's mm-hmm. the early part of the book is me just completely leveled by, I can't believe this is now going to happen. Um, and by that point, we had our son was eight and our uh, we'd had a daughter and she was three. So, you know, it was also facing knowing that there was nothing I could do. So we were just talking about healing and opening ourselves up and all of that and trying to create, you know, stability and, and love in our lives. And I had felt like I'd worked so hard coming from the childhood and home that I had um, you know, that everybody, uh, separated throughout the country and things like that to create this stable marriage. I'd left a marriage in order to create a healthy, solid marriage, right? <laughs> Bob had done the same. Um, Bob had actually also had a, a vasectomy when he was with his previous wife because she didn't want children. So in order to have children was a challenge for us. Uh, he went through two vasectomy re- reversals because the first one, uh, basically in, in layman's terms, he closed back up quickly. He was a good healer. So they had to do it twice. Um, and it was a big struggle for us to have our children. They were both kind of, you know, miracle babies. And then here we were, we had this, this house and this home that we had created. Our careers were finally, you know, kind of stable. And, and then this came and just knocked us over. So I really, I always equate it to like, you build this Lego thing in your living room, you you play with your kids, you build this giant thing, Godzilla comes and just like smashes it to pieces is what it really felt like in the beginning. And I had to sit with that for a while. So you were saying, you know, a lot of people close down and they can't be open. Bob and I process that more quickly, maybe than other people because of our past experiences. But definitely for about the first month after we knew he was dying, you know, we listened to sad songs and we drank a little too much wine and we cried a lot and held each other a lot and just couldn't wrap our heads around this. It was just insane. And then one day we looked at each other and we said, really, is this how we're going to play it? You know, this is the, the cards we were dealt and we're on the clock. And do we want to spend the rest of the time we have together grieving or do we want to celebrate the life that we've had and celebrate the time that we have left? And we said, yeah, that's, that's who we are. That's what we do. It doesn't mean we, you know, hide from the grief because we were still processing it throughout his entire illness, but we also were creating spaces and moments to celebrate and have joy. And that was a huge part of our focus was how can we just so embrace the time that we have left. And even with my therapist, you mentioned I was in therapy. I went back to the therapist I'd had earlier in life and who I'd also reached out to when my um, father and brother died. And uh, I didn't reach out to her until about six months into his illness. And then one day Bob said, okay, it's time. <laughs> like You need somebody other than me to talk to about me. And he was spot on with that. It was when, you know, I said I had to tell him that that he couldn't take the stairs anymore. He had to tell me it's time for you to talk to other people about me, you know, because we're reaching, you're going to need more support. And so I reached out to her and it was very, very helpful. And she said to me during one of our sessions, she said, you're, you're, and I'd go upstairs to our bedroom and talk on the phone. So I'd have a degree of privacy. And she said, so you're grieving and you're mourning and all this. And, And I, you know, I completely understand that. But right now, Bob is downstairs in the living room, very much alive. So like, you know, you want to be present for that. And I said, I absolutely do, you know, and that's, that was just that seesaw that um, going up and down with that emotion was just, that's what the 10 months were Um, going between, okay, it's, you know, I don't want to completely avoid that this is happening. I have to sit with that grief sometimes. And other times I have to get up and, and, you know, 
raise a glass of champagne or turn on the disco ball or whatever it takes, you know, whatever people do to make themselves feel better, dance, dance it out. Yes. And so you're describing intense trauma coupled with kind of pr- um, like grieving in the moment of of what's happening while also trying to balance the separate uh, the celebration of life which is important for you and bob and i think for all of us to appreciate what we've got you know our brain loves to go into the negative and think about all the threats but we've got to be able to be able to balance that and you her, you know i think heroically did that um through throughout the ups and downs and it's normal to want to deny what's happening and it sounds like that first month you were almost like wanting to numb it out you know and then i remember also you went to this doctor uh in chicago and bob was like apparently apparently with als i won't go into it too much but it's hard for them to tell you have als they have to just rule out everything else and um and if you have als it'll soon progress unfortunately but he was pressing the doctors hard and the doctor in Chicago said, get the hell out of here. He's like, you are in a minute in a positive way, which is you need to go live your life. You need to have, you need to do as much as you can with the time you've got and, and not sit here in misery uh, with this diagnosis, like get out there and, and do everything you've wanted to do and, you know, love your kids, which I thought was really interesting because we talked on about how Bob was very direct with people. And, and I do think that, there's a way to do that with like love and I'm on your team and I want the best for you. And I'm going to tell you my actual opinion and thoughts, take it or leave it versus the authoritarian model that we often mistake it for. I think in our culture, which is like to do this or else, or you're an idiot for not doing this. It's like that negative, like I know better than you bullshit versus like, I don't know better than you, but if I was you, this is what I would do. And take it or leave it. I'm doing this because I'm your friend. I'm saying t- saying some hard truths to you. And I think that doctor, I mean, it was something it aligned with Bob's philosophy and probably yours as well. But he really, he really made a bold statement to you when you were in the office. Yeah. And that's how Bob was with people. He, you know, he wasn't ever telling people to do, but he'd call them out if he could hear in their, you know, conversation, something that wasn't lining up because he's a mm-hmm. logician, right? He could get a logic of things they were saying. He'd say, but you just said this and then you said that. So like, mm-hmm. what's going on with that? <laughs> you know? So he always said, call, you kind of call people out, but in that gentle, nice, loving way, he didn't do it because he wanted to shame them or harm them. Right. He did it because he was trying to help them because he was trying to help them see these disconnects and make their lives better better. His whole goal was I'm making your life better. But yeah, Bob actually, um, in the book, uh, I mentioned that he actually diagnosed himself. Yes, there's no definitive test to know you have ALS. They just keep doing all sorts of tests on you to, for the things that they can test for and then say, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that. So actually, Bob had gone to first a specialist in St. Louis. We were sent to these major hospitals. You know, the Chicago one was actually our um, our going for a second opinion. But when he first went to St. Louis, he's the one that came out from that appointment and said to me, I have ALS. And I thought, oh no, they said he had ALS. And that was when I got the news. And, you know, a few hours after that, after the kids, you know, had taken naps and we had time to talk alone, he's, I said, so they said you had ALS. What exactly did they say? And he said, well, they didn't actually say it. And then I just looked at him aghast, like you told me had ALS. What do you mean they didn't say it? And he said, well, it's clearly what I have they talked to me like I wasn't, or they talked to each other as though I wasn't in the room. It's the only thing on the table. It's what I have. And I said, okay, well, Bob was never a drama king. Bob never said things he didn't 100% believe. That is not who he was. He was the most steadfast person when it came to his emotions and his mind being in sync that I'd ever known in my life and still have ever known. And I said, so what do we do? People are asking how this appointment went. And he said, you tell him I had ALS. And I 100% believed him. I knew him, you know, and so I did. It was a few weeks later that we actually got some more of those reports from the doctor. And we had the doc on speakerphone and he was giving the results. And so Bob said, you know, so what do you think I have? And he said, well, you know, we're still going to do some more tests and blah, blah, blah. And, and Bob just grilled him just like he would typically. He said, no, I mean, Okay, 
I'm not going to sue you <laughs> on a scale of one to 10. What are the odds? It's ALS. I need a number. I need to know because this is my life we're talking about. And if I'm dying, I want to know as soon as possible so they can get busy living. Like, so he was actually saying that before the doc in Chicago, because he was just like, look, I don't want to spend all my time waiting on a diagnosis. And actually a lot of people that I've talked to, they wait a year and a half, two years. They spend a lot of time going to appointments, trying to find out what they have. And by the time they know that that's what they have, they've spent their two, you know, a good portion. It's usually the standard diagnosis is two to five years um, after diagnosis is when you'll die, right? So if you've spent mm. two of those years looking to find out what you've had, you've lost a great deal of time. So I think, you know, I think it's, he was also an unusual patient because he wanted to hear the truth. And I think, you know, a lot of doctors are used to trying to, just as we say, death denying culture, right? They 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 have to kind of walk around it with patients. But again, this isn't something that serves us as a patient if we're not willing to hear the news, because if, if that's what you want your doctor to do, and they're reading that from you, and, they, and that's what they give you, you know, who can really blame them <laughs> for being careful with your emotions in that way? And yet it could make things worse for you in the long run that you weren't willing to hear the truth. Absolutely. And it's it's difficult, I think, you know, when we hear the truth uh, about something and and Bob was seeking the truth, like you said, he he wanted to know because he had a feeling and he had done. The, I mean, he's a logical person, like he's taught logic and philosophy and these sort of things. So I could just see him going, you know, what are the chances? I need to know the odds versus just like the doctor is trying to spare our feelings and let us kind of slowly get into it. Right. They don't want to have to mm -hmm. be like you have cancer and then every, you know, it's like that, that that's like the stereotype, like you have this and then everybody melts down. Right. Like they, it, I can see that they, you know, they're, they're not, no one wants to be able to, to have to be the one that delivers the bad news. But I do think truth is important, whether it's in a relationship or in medicine or anywhere. I mean, that's part of, I think people are disgusted by when we don't tell the truth, but in, in these situations, um, the truth is different than somebody making something up. It's like kind of like a choice to grasp the whole truth, to digest the whole truth and kind of leaning into the truth set you both free in a way to to try to live the best you could for his final months. You That's know, what's what strange seeing. is that actually when that doctor, the one that I just mentioned on the speakerphone said he had ALS, we actually felt a sense of relief, not that he had ALS, but that the waiting could be over because truly wait, you know, what's worse getting the phone call or waiting for a phone call? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, some people will debate that, but I find waiting and not knowing just so painful. Um, and so did Bob. So when when the doctor finally committed, we said, oh, you know, great. Now we can at least we can start doing something right because we know what we're facing. So now we now we have some control. And I think it's the lack of control that makes people really uncomfortable. That's why waiting is so difficult. Right. Um, and yet somebody some people will still avoid the control. But as soon as you know, as soon as we felt that relief of, OK, you know, ALS sucks, but at least now we know we're not going to spend our time wondering what it is. We can start to make some decisions and do some things and start to prepare. And Bob, you know, made a joke because he always joked. You mentioned the humor in the book. He said to that doctor at the end, he said, thank you so much for being honest with us because this is what we needed to know. And also, hey, if you're wrong, Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, that's great. Don't worry about being wrong. We're totally good with you being wrong on this. You know? right. Turns out I'm preparing for death and I get to live. Woohoo. You know, so yeah. And, you know, he left the doctor laughing about it because of course the doctors, I'm mean, sure the doctor was terrified. Like, what do I tell this? And he couldn't read our facial expressions. You know, we were two hours away back in our house. And right. But yeah, you know, I think there's something to that, to that too. Like control. Control is a big thing. It gives us, and that's why I think not being death denying as a culture, the more we can have those conversations, the more when tragedy does strike, we can feel some measure of control. And that gives us some degree of solace and, um, you know, confidence about what we're doing. And, um, 
Yeah. So that, that's part of these conversations too, that I'm hoping to continue, as, you know, as more people read the book and reach out and it's just, how can you have some measure of control that makes you feel like you're not spinning completely wildly, you know, out of control because these, these shocks to our system, not only, you know, mentally, but physically what goes on in our bodies when we are in shock, you know, all the chemicals being released and everything, you feel completely out of control. But if you, if you're sort of prepared, right, it's like showing up for the test in a class. If you haven't studied for the test uh, and you're staring at the, you know, you don't know any of the answers, it's you panic. But if you've studied, you may not know all of the answers and you may still be kind of stressed out. You're taking a test, but at least you, you feel some measure of control because, you know, like I've thought about some of this stuff already. I have some direction. And you can, at least after those initial shocks, after those body shocks, you can go to that place of knowledge that you built before the event. And that takes being open. And I think a, a level of maturity, I do think part of our culture's problem is that we do have a low level of maturity among um, a lot of leaders and um, rich people that have microphones. So... Um, what, I, what I, and it all starts, I think earlier, and then we'll go into your personal situation, but I see this starting early because in Western culture, we, we talk about wanting to pursue happiness and, 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 and feeling good and comfort and money and, and fame. And these sort of things are taught just through the culture when you're a little kid, if you're exposed to any media, maybe in, unless you're in some sort of cult somewhere where you don't have a television or a computer, you're probably going to be exposed to these ideas. And that runs counter to what, you know, I would say the Eastern world, uh, who is more in, not all of the Eastern world, but part of the Eastern world is, has more of a basis in Buddhism. And, uh, and, and so in Buddhism, life is seen as suffering. And part of the way to not suffer is to accept that you are suffering and that you will have both positive things happen to you, but also bad things happen to you. You will have uh, great pleasure and great pain. You will have um, you will have moments of like you know like possibly mini fame. You know maybe it's in your high school or some popularity or some positive things that happen to you. And you also have times when you feel ignored and lonely. And I feel like as a child, no one taught me that. Um, and so then when bad things happen, not only do, the, do you have to suffer through the bad thing, then you have to suffer through the psychological damage uh, that you were taught that, you know, you can avoid these bad things, which is total BS. Mm -hmm. And so then you have a double trauma. And so we, and then we see that even further with people that are in a very extreme religion where they don't even believe that certain things happen to you at all. And then when they do happen, then you have to figure out why the gods or God is doing this to you, which is like a triple trauma. And then you have parents that believe this. So that's a quadruple. So in your case, you and Bob had done some work here. You had done this philosophical, you know, questioning. And because you'd had early trauma, I don't know, I'm projecting maybe, but because you've had early trauma, you sort of were not prepared, but you had gone through it. You had survived. And so you you and Bob brought a level of maturity. And, and also you went through all the regular terrible things emotions that and suffering that you have to go through so not only did you go through the suffering but i do think maybe maybe you suffered I, it's hard to measure it but you suffered with grace i think because you knew that you were suffering and you accepted that you were suffering and you talked about the suffering and you talked about you know his last concert like when you went to see rush and he knew that was probably his last concert and this he knew that this was his last whatever and you talked about that which is just incredibly brave but yet that's where i think people we're already gonna have bad things happen but if we can go through them together and be honest about the fact that they are going to happen it's not there's not that double trauma where you know the therapist world we're coming in here with like trauma upon trauma upon trauma because of the thoughts and the setup to all this and the non-exposure makes it almost worse so what are your what are your uh, thoughts about that yeah, so I have a really good friend who's actually um, one of the characters in the book um, who there was one conversation we had actually, I don't know, sometime since I've been in Michigan um, and the book take, takes place in Illinois. And I, I we were asking each other how we were doing. And I said something like, you know, hills and valleys, you know, right now I'm on 
and I forget which one I was at at the time, you know, I'm on a hill or I'm in a valley. And and I said, you know, life, hills and valleys. And she said, yeah, when did we ever think it was anything? Why did we ever think it was anything but? Why did we ever think it was anything but? And that goes back to what you're saying about childhood. Nobody tells you that life, that's what life is. <laughs> you are sometimes at the top of a hill feeling wonderful. And sometimes you are at the absolute bottom and that's, you got to figure out how to get at least back, you know, partially up. You can't probably get all the way to the top of the hill all the time, but you know, that, that maintenance of, of contentment. And in the early, I th I've had readers say the early part of the book is the hardest to read. And of course, it was the hardest to experience looking back. And one of my friends, you know, shortly after Bob diagnosed himself um, and we were in those early throes of grief, somebody said, this is going, to, this is the worst part. This is going to be the worst part. And I got so mad. Like, how could you think that this is going to be the worst part? He is going to die. That is the worst part. How could you think that this, I was so mad. But by the time Bob died, I realized that person was right. The worst part was knowing he was going to die. It was coming because basically, and I say in the book, it was as though he died that day because the shock of it was the same as getting a phone call that says the person is gone. Mm -hmm. However, we have the privilege of preparing for it and making some choices and building some wonderful things together before he went, which is what you don't get when you get the shocking phone call. I've, I've experienced both terminal illness and sudden death. and. Um, you know, that that early shock was the part that in hindsight was actually the, you know, that early grief that we would normally feel that I had to process. By the time he died, not that I missed him any less or, or even now, I miss him so much. However, I had processed a lot. So I was in a better position to manage his dying than when somebody knocks on your door and tells you somebody has died. And so by, you know, seven, eight months into his illness, when we, you know, he ended up dying in 10 months, I was actually saying to people, if Bob were going to get a terminal illness, I am glad that he got it with me because I feel as though Many, you know, had he married somebody else who hadn't had the experiences of loss that I have had, they maybe wouldn't be handling this as well as I have. Not that it wasn't incredibly hard and still, you know, it's still incredibly hard. But I had that, as you said, sort of a toolbox of at least knowing I've gotten up before. And that's even what Bob was saying to me at different points in his illness. He's, and, I, and I would say, I don't want to. <laughs> You know, I felt like a toddler throwing myself on the floor, but I don't want to do it. You know, I wanted to have temper tantrums about his dying. Um, that was my emotional temper tantrum. But he would say, you've done it before and you can do it again. So he also believed like, look, I've seen you go through loss. We went through it together and, and you're going to be able to do this. And so trust that. And then when he would say that, you know, it would take me a moment and I would realize, yes, it's true. I've done it before, you know, if I can just buck up here and get up off the floor and stop being, you know, stop just doing my temper tantrum, I can do this, you know, there, so there was, there was a sense, a belief. Um, so I do think the suffering that we go through, if we go through it, and I, I always say the only way out is through. Um, so when, to me, when I say that, it's that shutting down that we talked about earlier. Um, you can't get out of something unless you go through the fire, like walk into it, you know, um, you have to walk into the pain and then, and then it's possible to come out the other side. But if you just bury it and shut it down, then it's, you're not making that, you're not opening up the possibility, which I mentioned earlier. Yes, so. I agree completely. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I wanted to ask some questions because obviously I want people to read the book because I think you have to, like anything in life, you have to, if you really want to know something and you really want to learn something, you've got to experience it. And I think reading a book like this is experiencing it versus the podcast is cool because we're talking about these philosophical points, but getting really into your story, your, your book isn't a philosophy book, it's a memoir. So it's going to really take you into it for the listener. I, I think there's a few questions I want to make sure to ask just because I think different people may be listening to this for different reasons. But um, just a couple, just going to the science real quick, totally changing this topic for a second. 
Um, ALS, this isn't like a podcast about ALS, but just a little bit about ALS and how it, you know, it basically causes a disability, but there is not, not a cure, but if you could just maybe comment a little bit about ALS for maybe people that are out there that have this experience or are going possibly through this. Sure. So ALS is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and it basically means no muscle nourishment. It's a motor neuron disease. It affects all of the muscles that you can control. Um, so muscles we can't control would be our heart, right? It continues to beat. We can't hold our heartbeat for a short time. We can't, um, we blink um, naturally, right? It's, it's, you can't kind of keep your eyes open for too long. They're going to blink on you. So um, it, it affects what you can control, you know, the gripping with your hand, um, making your legs move forward, raising your arms, um, swallowing. So it leads to disability, full disability, and typically people um, die of asphyxiation because you can hold your breath. Um, so the, as I said before, there's no uh, real diagnosis. Bob used to say they do a lot of like archaic things we did 300 years ago because there's a lot of, can you walk across the room? Can you lift your leg? You know, um, that sort of thing to figure out whether you have ALS and rule out other diseases, something like um, MS, for example, we have tests for now. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the reasons that we don't have a whole lot of um, information about LS is so few people are living with it at any given time. Mm -hmm. It's around 5,000 people who are diagnosed annually in the U.S. They die fairly quickly, as I said, two to five years post-diagnosis. And I remember when we were told that, Bob said, okay, doc, so let's give it to me straight. How many of those are, are good years? Like I'm actually not lying in a bed, um, you know, unable to bathe myself or feed myself because it often leads, if you make those decisions, to a tracheotomy and a feeding tube. So you're not breathing on your own. You're not eating on your own. Um, you're trapped in your body. Your mind is completely clear. So that's an, a really important thing. So one of the, uh, the you know tragedies of being completely trapped in this way and unable to speak um, is that your brain typically is unaffected. There has been some mild like dementia things with some ALS patients, but on the whole, that is not the case. And Bob was completely clear headed. Um, I think it doesn't get a lot of attention still with money because people do not know a lot of people with ALS. They don't see people living with ALS because they die fairly quickly. Um, we had to push really hard for him to have a power chair because the insurance company is like, he's going to die. We don't want to spend the money, <laughs> truly. Um, because when you have that sort of diagnosis, they're thinking we're going you know, to give you all this money for this custom power chair. And, you know, what, what's he going to use it a year or two, you know, as I think from an, a financial perspective. Um, I walk in the Grand Rapids ALS walk now annually, and we try to raise money. And it, it breaks my heart how little we're able to raise every year, not only as a team, but the whole association compared to some other illnesses because there just isn't awareness. And I was just as guilty. I knew nothing about ALS. And I admit that at the beginning of the book, I'd heard of Lou Gehrig's disease, right? But I didn't really know anything about it. And so part of why I wrote the book beyond, of course, the philosophical reasons that we said and the personal reasons was to raise awareness about ALS. And I'm committed to giving a portion of whatever royalties I receive every year to the ALS Association, whether, you know, they're coming in in 10 years and we're not walking anymore. I'll still give that, but I'm hoping we'll still be walking. Um, we start, I was not able to take part in that right away. It was grieving too heavily, but in 2016, we started walking. We've been walking ever since. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. And right now, ALS is relatively, you know, a low population, but you're, you're right that we don't know much about it. I mean, the doctors were just basically like, yeah, sorry, this is what happens. We don't know how to reverse this. Like, and there isn't anything we know about right now that can do anything for it. So I, I think that obviously needs more research and more awareness to be able to figure out what do we do about it? Is there a way to prevent it? Um, what are the common factors? But like you said, like people die so quickly, it's like, how do we study this? You know, that that's in the science department, but I think it's important to raise awareness about it. Um, because it, 
currently doesn't seem preventable. So we definitely need to study what we can do to to stop it, the progression or something like that. Go ahead. Yeah. And I should add that 95% of the cases are what they consider sporadic, which means they come out of nowhere, which they did with Bob. And 5% are familial. So it runs in a family and you've lost your grandparents and a parent and, you know, and, and you know, this is coming for you. So I think they're able to do more research on the familial because they can, you know, identify people who are likely to suffer from ALS and do some of the testing. But the sporadic has been really hard for them to figure out. Um, And uh, yeah, I think it's the, it's, you know, the need for the testing right now, there's two drugs available. They just, um, the FDA just passed one, but you know, my first question when people ask me, and I don't know a lot about the drug, but I said, okay, but what part of your life does it extend? Because the one that had been, you know, on the market, it might extend your life, but not necessarily the good part, you know? So there's a question and it's not extending it very much either. So we really don't, there's still really not a treatment. There's a little bit of treatment, right? But there isn't really the kind that we think of when we think of something like cancer as as, because it could lead to a cure. These are treatments that might give you a few more months. Mm -hmm. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot more that needs to be done with that. Um, and the ALS, they have their own foundation, or is it under the musk, the other one? The, they, the... they are their own association, but okay. um, like a lot of the support materials and things that I was given are under the Muscular Dystrophy Association. So mm-hmm. I consider it the umbrella organization. So, but, so I don't know, I guess how they're re- related, you know, precisely, but there are sometimes the umbrella organization as well. The MDA association puts out a lot of ALS association materials and then the ALS association association also puts out its own materials. So it's kind of a combination thing. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. I wanted to ask a couple more, two more questions that I had. Um, the meaning behind the title, find a place for me. Um, it seems intriguing, but I was curious what some of your thoughts are or what, you know, why you named the book that. So that's something that Bob actually says, um, and it's later in the book, but so rather than maybe give that away entirely, although I, I, I guess I can, because actually I wrote a little article that's out there and available about the title, um, on Mindy McGinnis's blog, but yeah, so he made, I asked Bob to make videos for me and the kids, um, while he was still well enough and he made one for me. And on that video, he tells me that I'm going to have to find a place for him. Mm. And I also think throughout his whole illness, he was trying to find a place for me. He was trying to help me in a different way. Um, to, to, you know, because I was the one being left behind. He was trying to teach me to find a place in the world without him. Um, but he was also saying at the end of his life, in order for me to go on and thrive and love again, which he really hoped I would, he hoped I would have that in my life. He hoped our children would have another person to nourish, nurture them and love them. Um, but he, he knew that I couldn't let him occupy all of my thoughts, all of my heart, right? If I were going to make room for somebody else. And so I think there's a lot of literal literal and figurative meaning to my selection of title um, that I wanted to, you know, I wanted it to be a little ambiguous too, so that, and and also find a place for Bob. I kind of hope readers find a place for him um, after reading this book. I found a place for him literally in the book. So, yes, I mean, when I was reading the book, I was like, dang, Bob sounds like the coolest guy to hang out with. Like, he sounds like, (laughs) you know, like you guys said you were kind of somewhat introverted, like to read books and hang out on the weekends. But, you know, with a few friends, I was like, it sounds like Bob would be hilarious at a party and just like having a great time. (laughs) So I was like, (laughs) his his personality (laughs) comes through in the book completely. And I think that you captured that well, which I think is a very, yeah, I think that is a place, you know, for him to to be known in this in this through your work. Um, you know, so. my birthday was a couple of weeks ago and his father called me and it, to wish me happy birthday. And he said, I got to tell you, I'm reading the book. And I said, you don't have to do that because I know, you know, this could be horribly oh, painful. Goodness. Yeah. Son. 
I said, you really don't have to do that. And he said, no, no, I want to do it. And he said, I read it a chapter at a time, you know, and then I come back to it when I'm ready to read the next chapter. But then he said, I got to tell you, when Bob's talking, I hear him. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's that's all I need to hear. That's the best gift ever. If like Bob's dad hears Bob in the book, then you know the the writing is winning there because that's that was the goal to really have him authentically come through as a full character. Yes, absolutely. I think and I think in the writing, and I'll just you know say my little opinion here for the listeners out there. It's definitely a must read, you know, and I I read as much as I can of every book. And I have like one or two chapters left in this one before I interview uh, authors. But I, I think this book, I, I felt like I was like, I, I feel like I know Deirdre already, like just from reading this, you know, like I felt like I was like, wow, like I, I totally see, you know, and so I feel like it's that personal and and that personality and the personalness between you and Bob sharing in, in this book, I think is why this book is um going to be on some short lists of, of must read because, uh, it, it, it isn't just like a textbook, but it, it tells you so much about life and grief and ALS and parenting and caregiving and disability all, all through a story versus a more of a, a lecturing or a teaching lens. Uh, but it teaches quite well, um, through it, but it's very personal. So I want to thank you for, uh, for doing this. I, I can't imagine well, first of all, I can't imagine going through what you went through, but then actually having to relive it, I think, by writing it, I think it was possibly very difficult. Um, I, I can't, I don't know, how how did you do with writing it? Thank you so much. So um, for the nice things that you said, for your, your generosity, I, I actually went away to writing residencies. I wrote pretty furiously because, you know, as somebody who's a professor and a mom and a wife and all these things, when I go away to a writing residency, I really seize the day <laughs> and say, I've got this much time. I've got to churn out as much as I can. I work really hard. I don't, you know, I take a few walks, I eat, and that's about the extent of it. Um, maybe meet somebody I've just met for, you know, coffee, but I, I really put my head down. And, and I wrote the draft in less than a month over three writing residencies over two different summers. It's a very hard book for me to write when I was at home because you do have to burrow into those emotions and be completely in your mind um, to create those scenes and to recall them. And I wanted to be in a place where I didn't have to be responsible for not only practical life things, but em emotions, right, of other people when I was, because you, you can't just go into that so deeply and then come out and be like, okay, let's, you know, make dinner and talk about whatever, <laughs> you know, I needed to be completely isolated. Um, at the same time, I did wait until I start. I really started writing the book. I wrote a few pages, you know, back when Bob was alive, um, but it was really shelved about six years in. And I would also say that reliving it, I, I imagine looking back, there were some hard times where I was going through those emotions, but there was also a lot of, just like there was in life, a lot of joy in writing the humorous moments and in writing our loving moments and recalling those and just appreciating them from a kind of a height, a distance, right? Away from when it had happened. And that that kind of reliving was actually joyous because I got to spend time with Bob again in my mind, creating him on the page. And that was lovely. Um, so I guess it's about, you know, having some distance and being ready and then going through, going to the other side of things. And now I feel it's very interesting. I've lost some of the memories because, and I've told students this when I teach writing, one of the pleasures um, of writing, you know, is going through it. But once you have it down on the page, if it's something that you've been carrying, you found a place for it. Going back to that title, you mm -hmm. put it somewhere. And now you don't feel the same like need to carry it. And that means like, I don't have to worry about losing those memories. They're there. I've got them. They're good to go. And so I don't have to relive them quite as much in my daily life or feel like a pressure to not forget because I won't forget now. I can pick up the book and remember. And that that I think took took some weight off of, you know, I have to carry him all the time because I don't want to forget. I want to pass these stories to our children. I want to, you know, so I'll remember other things at different points and, you know, throughout my life and share them with the kids. I've always talked openly with the kids. We, we all have about Bob and, re, you know, 
remember him all the time. We we go on the walk every year. We light candles and, you know, talk about him on his birth birthday and things like that. But now I also know that no matter what happens to me, Bob's got a place. And that, that meant something to me. Yes, I appreciate that, uh, Deirdre. And I think that is actually a perfect place to kind of move towards the conclusion of the interview. Um, I want to ask you a question. I'm going to I'm going to poise it and then I'm going to actually read where people can buy your book while you're thinking about the answer. <laughs> but okay. is there something you want? This is a pause, but do, is there something you want listeners to know um, out there that you think maybe for the very broad audience that listens to this actually all over the planet, uh, according to the download statistics? Um, what What's something you wanted them to know? And while you're saying that, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to tell everybody, Regal House Publishing did publish this book. And uh, there are places you can get it, like Packed Press. If you're in Michigan, you get it at Books and Mortar, Grand Rapids, Artworks. I've not known where that is. But bookshop.org, which is a huge um, favorite of this podcast, has this book, uh, Find a Place for Me by Dr. Deirdre Fagan. But if you, if you just type in Deirdre Fagan, you should find it. Uh, Barnes and Noble, of course, and Amazon, the beast. Um, what, uh, what are some, th maybe something you want listeners to know or, or, or I, something like that? Yeah. I want them to know that there's always hope that hope is always possible. And, um, I'm going to go back to the phrase I used earlier that, that it's, I, th I think one of the best ways to find that hope is to do what I mentioned earlier, which is to love your way forward to be open to the relationships you can form with other individuals. And I always want to, you know, um, add the comment that when I say love, I, you know, people's minds often go to romantic love. That is one possibility, but so is deep friendship. You know, so is renewal of, of, of relationships with people who have been in your life, but, you know, and are surrounding you. Um, but maybe you haven't put in, a lot of effort to get to know better or to be open to. I think when we walk through the world open, it's amazing the kinds of connections we can make with other people. And if you need some sort of help, you need some sort of nurturing yourself. Also, if you are open and you share that, it's amazing how many people will come forward for you. Because that's something I also have learned throughout my losses. And I had to remember when Bob was sick is that I too wanted to be private and quiet. I'm naturally a, a fairly private person. I'm selective about what I open up, you know, to everyone. I have the people I open up to completely and then I'm selective, right? I'm careful about who I let in. But when Bob was sick, I knew we were going to need to let a lot of people in if we were going to have any sort of, you know, support system. And if I were going to have people in my life afterwards, they need to go on the journey. It's like I said early on about the student with the memoir, who I said, we have to fall in love. <laughs> you know, We have to be on the whole journey with this fella. It's the same in anything. If you open up, people want to be there. People want to help others on the whole. I really truly believe that, but they can't help you if they don't know you need help. And, and they can't love you or fall in love with you if they don't know that you want you want to fall in love and that you you want a friendship. You have to be open. So love your way forward. There you go. I think that's very sage advice. And I'm uh, excited for people to hear this episode. So I just want to thank you, Deirdre, for coming on the Intentional Clinician podcast and giving us your time. Thank you so much. It was so wonderful talking to you. What a rich conversation. Thank you. My pleasure. And there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast with myself, Paul Krauss, your host. As some of you know, I am passionate about preventing future violence in the United States. And you may not have known that I started a nonprofit called the National Violence Prevention Hotline, which is a 501c3 organization. We are endeavoring to gain funding so that we can start a 24-7 hotline and online chat line to reach potential perpetrators before they act violently. It is a bold effort to curb violence and save innocent lives by working to connect with potential offenders while they are in the planning stages of violence. Help them to de-escalate 
and provide resources so that they can get appropriate professional help. The National Violence Prevention Hotline is looking to open up a conversation about violence in society, the causes, and find solutions. And you can learn more by visiting our website at violencepreventionhotline.org. Join us by signing our petition, sharing the website with your network, or donating to the cause. Again, that's violencepreventionhotline.org. If you are looking for an Emdria consultant, I am now an Emdria consultant and can provide 20 hours needed to become Emdria certified. If you want to contact me, check out my website at counselingsupervisorgr.com or healthforlifegr.com and send me a message. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area at Health for Life Counseling and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting healthforlifegr.com. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon literature and experience in life and the fields they work in, this should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please call 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988. You can also text the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by texting 741741. If you're a person of color, you can text Steve. I believe you just type help if you want to just write help to 741741. A live trained crisis counselor will respond via text. Did you know that you could support your local bookstore by shopping online at www.bookshop.org? You can order your books that you want when it's snowing or in inclement weather without traveling to your local bookstore, and they still get a portion of the proceeds, keeping the brick-and-mortar bookstores alive in the United States. If you are a therapist and you are not a member of your local counseling organization, I implore you to join right now. It's a business write-off, and it's just plain smart. If you want to keep your license and keep mental health care open to the community, join now. The American Counseling Association, the American Mental Health Counselors Association. If you're in a specific state, you can join the Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association or the Arizona Counselors Association. It's just the smart thing to do and the right thing to do. Until next time, on The Intentional Clinician, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week. What glows beneath all the pain and anguish Love that doesn't die Make my embroidering Love, a small word unable to hold Well, we stretch at its meaning Now this What's this new version of love That intrudes into the peace I thought I had This love has no recipient But still lies there smoldering Indifferent stars in the night sky Watch me while I turn Still holding this love for you Without a thing to do But try to live in this uninvited Without a home in your life or heart Without a shelter at all Exposed and burning still This unattended fire For no one emanates A wasted warmth on the wind Pushing against the edges of what it means to give lost wisdom and sparks that rise and die even if I never get to see you again 
I'll know that when we collided We both broke each other open Rose petals were blustering And I'm determined still To hold this open door Even now as it devastates I wake up gasping in the void again Speak sky, blow fast, exhale to dissipate Be always gathering clouds of yearning memory All that we foresaw, laid out before Back into the open ocean It's all horizons